All right, we have hit our final set of notes for the unit four, sensation and perception, AP psych content. What we're moving into now is perceptual interpretation. So we're gonna move away from those faulty senses of you know, how we organize stimuli that's presented to us. Um, you know, much of what we covered was an emphasis of how our perception oftentimes isn't accurate in certain scenarios when we were covering the perceptual organization notes. Now what we're going to be moving into is an issue of the nature-nurture debate and how we interpret stimuli. Basic question we want to ask ourselves in this structure is, is the way that we understand the world around us innately born within us, which is that nature aspect of the debate, or is, does it come from experiences that we have throughout our lifetime that give us that kind of background knowledge to be able to understand what we're presented with. And that's the nurture portion. If you look at restored vision studies, back in 1932, those with cataracts had, had surgery performed on them, and they were blind adults that had had those cataracts. Once the cataracts were removed, they could regain their sight. And when they were presented with an image like this here, just to the right, they could tell and differentiate that this right here was a different shade than the background. So they could differentiate that there was, you know, figure ground establishment, which we talked about with gestalt principle. But what they couldn't do was that they couldn't discriminate between the difference of this object and that. They couldn't tell the difference between triangle and circle. And much of that was purely just because they hadn't ever been presented with this visual stimuli before they had this surgery because they were blind. So much of our understanding of the nature-nurture debate and how we are able to develop perception of the world does tend to um, adhere towards a bit of nurture. What furthers this focus on nurture are sensory deprivation studies. Blakemore and Cooper took baby kittens in 1970 and they raised these kittens without any level of exposure to horizontal stimuli in their environment. So you can see here these kittens were raised in cylindrical spheres and they also put a cone around their neck so that way when they were raised and as they aged all they had been presented with in terms of stimuli is these vertical lines. Now we can remember back to perceptual organization that we are able to, naturally speaking, determine certain levels of perception. We talked about the visual cliff and babies and how they are able to differentiate depth at six months old. But sensory deprivation studies show us that there is an aspect to nurture of this issue as well because when these kittens were allowed out of this cylindrical sphere, they had a really hard time perceiving horizontal bars. So for example, if you were to put a toy in front of their face and you held it up, we're going to pretend my phone is a toy. If you held it up like this for them in front of them, they'd bat at it and they'd paw and they'd get it. If you held it like this, no recognition. They wouldn't know what it was. They wouldn't recognize that it was a toy because they had never been presented with this stimuli to be able to develop a perception of it. So. We do know then that vision is, at least partially, a bit of a nurtured sense within us. Perceptual adaptation occurs when our visual ability to adjust to something that is artificially um, put into our visual field is able to occur. So you can see this image right here, okay? Um, prism glasses, for example, they alter various different uh, angles of perception. Um, you can think about them in, in terms of the drunk goggles that are put on when you go through driver's ed school. It alters and distorts your perception. So when you have the ability to adjust um, and continue to function normally, you're able to do this because of perceptual adaptation. Much of what we can struggle with when it comes to adapting to our environment based on perceptions that we hold is because of a perceptual set. This is a predisposition we have to perceive a certain thing 
um, and to look at one thing that could be taken as A or B um, or that could have shades of gray and we perceive it only as black or white. So a perceptual set is what establishes that for us. Typically, perceptual sets won't lead us astray. They can be fairly accurate and provide us with conclusions that are, for the most part, right. Every once in a while, though, they can lead us slightly astray. So if you look at this image here, this is a very well-known image that was uh, taken out of uh, Scotland that is supposed to represent Nessie the Loch Ness Monster. Many believe that this is not some kind of, you know, uh, monster that is out there in the world is actually just a weird looking wonky tree branch that's floating in the water. So those both are means of perceptual set. Another example, this right here. Did you see a flying saucer first or did you see clouds? Both of those had predispositions established when, within them because many of you guys no doubt probably saw, oh, this is up in the air, it's in blue sky, it's a little white, I see that as a cloud. That's your perceptual set enabling you to organize and interpret that information. What determines a perceptual set is something called a schema. A schema is our attempt at organizing and interpreting any kind of unfamiliar information. So when you're first presented with certain concepts, your brain is attempting to interpret and organize what those are, and that's a schema. Kids schemas oftentimes represent reality. So, you know, when children are asked to draw something, it will usually be their family, um, siblings, parents, things like that. They will also represent what they see. Um, so this is when you get kind of those fantastical creatures that they'll draw or the drawing of imaginary friends. So this is what establishes our schemas. Schemas develop through experience. So again, this is very much an aspect of nurture within this debate. The more that you are exposed to various different experiences and perceptions of others and stimuli in general, the more your schemas will be able to develop and the more you'll be able to attempt to organize what it is you are presented with. It's important for you to note that context of stimuli that you're presented with matters when it comes to the establishment of your mental set, set and the establishment of a schema that is it's important that you keep in mind that contextual effects matter when it involves you trying to interpret the world around you because that's all that a perception is. When you're given a certain stimulus, it can evoke radically different perceptions based on the immediate context of the stimulus that you're presented with. So if you look at this image right here, it looks like these babies are kind of upset or crying, but what if they're not? What if, in fact, they are uh, responding to just make a noise. What if this little girl right here is actually laughing? Just looks like her face is a little weirdly shaped and distorted. So contextual effects matter when we are attempting to look at and interpret the information that we are presented with. One such context to keep in mind is cultural context. Culture matters when it comes to our understanding of the world around us. And we've alluded to that a few times in class. If I were to say to you, here's some warm pop, most of you guys wouldn't want it, purely because of the cultural context that we here in the United States like our drinks. Another example is this visual image here. If you were someone from East Africa, so Somalia, um, Ethiopia, an area like that, you would actually see in this image, you would think that based on your culture, the woman right here is carrying a box on her head. For us, we would see that as a window. For us also, we would see this back here as kind of like a, you know, a pillar. But for those from East Africa, they'd see this as a tree and that this is a family sitting under that tree. So because of this, there are actually psychologists out there called human factors psychologists. And what they attempt to do is apply principles of psych to products and their creation and designing processes to boost productivity and minimize safety issues. And we'll typically use and implement perceptual, contextual aspects with regard to how we interpret certain stimuli. 
psychologists work within these human factors. Um, what they'll do is they'll spend a lot of their time just doing research and then applying what they know about our behavior and our perceptions and our interpretations of things. And they'll try to create more usable products um, or more work-friendly environments based off of those perceptions. So here's an example. If you were to look at all three of these images, and you were to tell me which one was your preference, which one you thought looked um, cooler, we'll say, more than likely you would have gone with this right here. Mostly because it's, uh, you know, the look of it, but certainly because it's a whole lot easier to read. For a dial like this, you know, the more traditional car dashboard style, I mean, you've got to gauge maybe where you are in terms of in between 80 and 90. This one, same thing. Uh, this one gives you, you know, there's a 20 mile an hour difference in this gauge. Down here, though, it'll print it out for you. It gives you the exact number of the mileage that you are going per hour. So it's super simple. You don't have to think. A human psychologist, excuse me, a human, a human factors psychologist helped to design that. Another example is this difference here between these two oven sets. The knobs for the stove burners over here are a lot easier to understand. You can see based off of the grid. This goes here, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there. This one, you'd have to look at it and you've got to look at uh, these little graphics right down here to tell you, oh, this one goes to the top up here. And this one goes to the bottom down here. So this is much easier. Human factor psychologists help to design these and assist in their development based off of our natural perceptions. So some of this stuff really is more applicable to your everyday life than you would think. So understanding these various different um, error-prone behaviors and how we are not always perfect can oftentimes end up helping us to advance um, safety aspects because of human factors psychologists. We're going to redirect the conversation a little bit here and talk about extrasensory perception. ESP. ESP is a really weird thing because it's supposed to be this perception that we can um, establish without sensory input. So, for example, being able to read a person's mind or to pick up an object across the room with your mind. That's what ESP involves. Most scientists at the end of the day don't believe in ESP. Uh, there is no scientific evidence out there to support it, and so that's typically why most psychologists don't agree with it. However, there are, four, there are four major types of ESP that I would like you to make sure that you are aware of, and then we'll move into um, how psychologists have attempted to research this. First is telepathy. This is mind-to-mind -mind communication, so Twilight fans. This is Edward's ability to read. Clairvoyance is your ability to perceive an event as it's happening now, even though you are not at that um, location. So you could sense that a friend's house is on fire. Another example is precognition. This is our ability to predict the future. So I'm going to use Twilight again. Alice. Alice is a precognizant. She can predict future events. And then the last one is psychokinesis. This is your ability to move things with your mind. So this is oftentimes presented with like superheroes and stuff, which is a good indication that most people are not able to do it, hence why most don't believe that ESP exists. And one way that we can see this is putting ESP to the test. At one point, there was a gentleman who decided that he wanted to go about testing truly if people could predict um, certain aspects of the future, quote unquote. And so he got 28,000 people who claimed that they, in some way, shape, or form, had psychic ability. Okay, and he wanted to see if they could predict what a coin flip would be. So anytime he would flip a coin, he'd tell them, "Okay, what's it going to be? Heads or tails?" People were able to correctly uh, assess the coin toss 49.8 percent of the time, which doesn't mean anything because you're always going to have a 50% 50, 50 shot of getting it right or wrong anyway. So it ended up proving um, pretty exponentially that ESP and psychic ability in particular isn't, is, isn't all that terribly accurate. But at the end of the day, it's important to recognize that people do still believe that there are certain things that just can't be explained. 
other than just that there might be this extrasensory possibility that we can pick up on it in a remote manner. So this is the end of unit four. Let me know if you have any questions.